Le, le Mont Blanc sera ma prochaine montagne, mais pour le coup, c'est elle qui est Manjaro. So, of course, change matters. Change is a transformation, a variation, a modification. And as long as there is life, there are changes. I learned in yoga to go with the flow without too much resistance. And we are individual, we are part of a community, we are part of the universe. And the universe is always in movement, and an unstoppable movement. And so we, le we, we have to learn to practice flowing, to practi practice breathing throughout the pain, observing without too much reaction. We need to learn how to dance on different musics. And so my story today is not a story about letting go of emotions, letting go of people, letting go of memories, letting go of the past. My story today is a story about letting in, letting in the changes and allowing them to happen. So here we go. For my 30th birthday, I thought it was a brilliant idea to climb the highest mountain on Earth. Mount Everest, and only my two big brothers thought it was a great idea because it was great on my resume. But actually, when I watched the movie Everest, everybody dies or lose a nose, lose a feet, lose an arm. So I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to change that. And I chose to climb the highest mountain in Africa, the Kilimanjaro. And of course, I was climbing this with someone I barely knew or at least I didn't really connect with her anymore. I chose to climb this mountain with myself, and I was quite afraid, but I knew that the only way to reconnect with my truth and to get to know me more was by experiencing something completely unknown, a challenge for me, and something, most importantly, something beautiful. And so, as soon as I decided to climb this mountain, changes started to happen. And I, de I decided to, to climb this mountain only two weeks before I actually flew there, because I'm not such a great planner. And you know what, like in yoga, save the drama, just make it happen. But a lot of changes happened, a lot of emotion came to me. Fears, doubt, apprehension, and of course it's excitement. And my father thought it was a, a, a good idea and a mental support to send me videos on people dying on the Kilimanjaro. So, I mean, that, that helped a lot. I was uh, fucking scared. I was scared of not achieving. I was scared of getting sick. I was scared of the lack of oxygen. I was scared of a lot of things, and people had all those opinions about climbing the Kilimanjaro on train, or just opinions on their own story about the Kilimanjaro. And so, you know what happened? I had all those fears, all those bad emotions, all those negative emotions that, was based, that were based on the unknown. And at the end, I was the first one of the group reaching the top of this mountain. I wasn't obliged to climb the Kilimanjaro, but I was obliged to one thing. I, have, I was obliged to prove to myself that life and the unknown couldn't be feared. And so I flew there. I grabbed some stuff, some very cute outfit from Forever 21 and Zara to climb the mountain. I also had time to buy some hiking boots, baby blue hiking boots, very cute hiking boots. And I also thought it would be a great idea one week before to climb, to prepare a bit and climb the Hollywood sign in Los Angeles. So, no, I wasn't prepared physically. But the most important thing that I was prepared mentally. And that was the only thing I needed. And so, I went there with my cute outfits, and I arrived in the Kili at the Kilimanjaro airport, airport, a very tiny one. The, flights were, the two flights were long, but everything went well. And I was waiting there at the Kilimanjaro airport with other hikers, professional hikers, and other crazy students celebrating their graduation by hiking in Tanzania. And so I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And then I was the only one left at the Kilimanjaro airport with my sparkling Tom shoes and my cute outfit. But there was a problem. There was no bag. And I was expecting people. I was expecting to die on this mountain because of my father's videos. I was expecting to get tired. I was expecting to get disappointed. But I wasn't expecting for Air Canada to lose my bag. So I was still, I was there. I didn't know what to do. At one point, I needed to meet with my guide who was in the middle of nowhere because he had a flat in the middle of nowhere because it's Africa. And so I met with him and we were sitting on two Coca-Cola red chairs under a red big Coca-Cola umbrella in the middle of the snakes and the Maasai and we were discussing the situation. 
And at the end, he reached a conclusion. He said to me, Akuna Matata. And I'm like, what? Akuna Matata? There's a big Matata over here. I didn't have my bag and I needed to climb the mountain. And so I quickly understood that in Africa there was no planning. And it was okay. Because things happen, life happen, there are changes happening all the time. And I wasn't, be, I wasn't able to depart with my initial group. But actually, Akuna Matata, and for a lawyer, I'm trained to see the problem, to analyze the problem, to focus on the problem. So Akuna Matata wasn't a mantra of mine. But it was actually the best conclusion that there was at this moment. Akuna Matata. So what we did, I was chilling with the Maasai for two days and swimming in blue lagoons, wonderful blue lagoons, but I was still kind of hoping for my bag to come and to magically appear. And so at what point, um, he just said without any warning, because in Africa there's no warning, it was maybe 6 a.m. in the morning, he said, okay, you're going, you have a new group, you have a new leader. So we went, we stopped in the middle of the street, or what they call the street, and we grabbed a very broken, dirty sleeping bag, and he grabbed some very ugly, heavy hiking boots that were not my size at all. And I met with the group, and I met with this new leader of the group. And here, here, here it was, another, another challenge. My guide was, was smoking this huge jamba thing, or like marijuana thing, and this guy, I needed to trust him with my life to bring me very high on the mountain but he was clearly already very high. But I had, no, no, I had no choice, I needed to trust him. And so I did trust. I did trust him. And the first day was really hard for me. The first day I was obsessed with the bag I didn't have. Um, the shoes were too big, my back was hurting because the, the backpack that they rented for me was broken. It was a mess, I was unhappy, I wasn't enjoying it at all. And when the guide was asking my group, how did you find your first day? I said, well, on a scale to zero to 10, it's clearly an eight on 10, it's super difficult. And the other girls were saying, no, it might be a zero, one or two on 10. And then I saw his expression, his facial expression. I was screwed, I was not gonna make it. I was not gonna be able to reach that mountain. I was so disappointed. And the nights there were so, so cold. It was really harsh and the girls were crying because it was so cold. They were from, they were Dutch. Like they, it was cold for them. I'm Canadian, I was, I was kind of okay, but it was, we're talking about minus 20 degrees at night. And with my broken sleeping bag, I wasn't really sleeping in my bag. I was, I was waking up every morning kind of beside my bag. And so it was hard, but something really happened. Something during that first night, something happened, a change happened, a switch happened. And in the morning, and I'm not sure if it's a survival mode or if it's just the will to enjoy it, to make it happen, I'm not sure what it was, but in the morning, I found all the socks I could to make the boot feet fit, and it did. I lost this broken back sack, and I cut the water in half that I was carrying, and I made it happen. Actually, I focused on what I had to make it happen and forgot about what I didn't have. And that was the trick. And the second day was very difficult, like more difficult than the first one, technically. But I had a smile on my face. And for me, I was lighter and it was easier. So th the second day was a good day. And of course, I met a lot of people on the Kilimanjaro. And one of them was a mid-aged woman from Belgium. And she was telling me, while looking at the mountain, she couldn't make it a day at a time. She was making it, she was saying to herself, I can do it one little step at a time. Poli poli, like they say in Swahili. And she had this dream 15 years ago of climbing this mountain. So she was convinced that she wanted to enjoy it, slowly, slowly. She had a big smile on her face, and it wasn't a race for her. It wasn't a race, it was just a beautiful challenge. And the other girls that were with me were very speedy. They were strong, they were athletic, they were determined, and they were fast. And on that third day, they got very, very sick. They had stomachache, they had headaches, they were vomiting, and they had a very hard time breathing. And the only thing I could tell myself was, I'm gonna end up like this. I'm gonna get sick, it's just a matter of hours or days, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna die like them, it's gonna happen. 
And you know what? I never got sick on the Kilimanjaro. I never felt the thin air. I never felt the lack of oxygen. All those fears, all those negative emotions, again, were not justified. The fears never were justified. And so here I was, again, the first to reach the top of the mountain. The fourth day, the fourth night, something magical happened. So it was still cold, I was still sleeping beside my sleeping bag. And then I heard something in the middle of the night. I heard my name, someone was calling my name. Someone was saying, Naomi, Naomi. And they loved my name because it was easy to pronounce for them. So Naomi, Naomi, maybe they're just asking for me. And so I snaked my head out of the tent and then I saw that. I saw magic people. I saw it happening. I saw a small, tiny Tanzanian man covered head to toe with sand and dirt. And at his feet, my huge Canadian hockey bag. And I'm not sure how this bag came back to me. It found its way back to me. But I tipped this guy like I never tipped before. And we made a party out of it. We had chocolate all over the, uh, the face. We were, I mean, it was Christmas, so Hanukkah, whatever, Chrismika. But we were dancing in the tent. We were squeezed, four girls together in that tent. And we were very happy. But what I take from this is that when I left Montreal, I thought I didn't have enough with me. I thought it was not enough clothes, not enough things. And at the end of the day, I didn't need any of the stuff to climb the mountain. But I could have never been that grateful and never enjoy that stuff if I had never lost the bag before. So that was a big lesson for me. And the surprises kept coming, kept coming. And on the fifth day, I was going to the bathroom on the camp, and believe me, the toilets there can have their own TED talk. It's an experience that nobody wants to live. It's, 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 it's a very difficult experience, and it's something I will, will remember forever. But however, so I was on my way to the toilet, and I crossed this amazing, cute guy. People, after the fifth day, my hair were doing their own thing. I'm not sure what they were doing. I was covered in sand and dirt, and we were not showering for for seven days, but I got a date on the Kilimanjaro. And in the area of, of Tinder and dating apps and whatever, like finding the match is so difficult, I got a date. And so he asked me uh, for a walk. Of course I said no, I was walking for seven hours, seven days. So I said yes for a drink and the sunset, so it was very romantic. So we sat there and we were looking at the sunset. But when I was looking at the sunset, some, I felt something that I knew in theory was important, but I never embodied it. I never really felt it. I felt faith. Faith in me and faith in life. And when I forget this, I try to remember that exact moment when I embodied that. Just faith. And so the last day was very feared by a lot of people because it's the final ascension, like it's final hike, it's seven hours in the cold, the girls were getting very sicker and sicker, they had a really hard time breathing at this point, but we needed to wake up in the middle of the night to do that final hike to reach the summit, so it was difficult. But we woke up and we started walking. We couldn't even drink because our camel bags were frozen. And so we started walking and then I turned around. And what I saw, what I saw was amazing. I saw hundreds of hikers behind us forming these zigzags of lights. And the feeling I had was, we're not alone. We're not alone, I'm not alone. We're all in this together and we're all kind of suffering together, but we are, are doing it together and we chose to do it together. And that feeling, that feeling was amazing. And so the girls were getting sicker and their breathing was harder and then something else happened. The guide started to sing in Swahili with his deep, deep voice to cover the breathing, the girls' breathing. And I never trusted that guy as much as in this moment because it was the only thing that could have brought us strength, actually. And it was fucking amazing because we, we, were, we were very tired, my eyes were closing because I was tired, and the girls were, were kind of dying there. 
And so his deep human voice were saving us in a way. And so we continued for a bit and then really near the top of the mountain, I thought my flashing light was, was dying, but it was not dying. When I turned around again, I saw this amazing landscape. I never seen that, that scenery. It was, it was beautiful, but not the beauty, like another level of beauty. I saw two balls of light, same size, same light, same color, humongous. They were enormous, and they were bright, and all the stars were still there. And that landscape, that landscape made me feel so grateful. And for the first time of my life, it actually was the first time of my life, I was a bit old, 30 years old, but first time of my life that I felt gratitude. Gratitude to simply be a witness of this beauty. I never saw this beauty again, but I think that every morning we should wake up with this gratitude just before the nature, just before what's happening before our eyes, because it's miraculous. People, this journey wasn't about reaching the summit. It was about each step we took during that journey. Poly, poly, slowly, slowly. The mid-aged woman never made it to the top. She collapsed a few hours before reaching the top and she was brought to the hospital. As for my three, three girls, they were in very bad shape, so they were brought very quickly to the nearest hospital. But my story here is about adjusting, accepting the unknown, saying yes, saying yes to the future or to dates. If life is a mountain, we're all in it together, but we need to have faith, we need to have gratitude, and we need to remember to be light, take a lighter backpack maybe, and also to let it in, let it all in, and allowing the change to happen, because this is the way we're gonna reach higher summits. I thought about a conclusion and I could only choose one and I think it's a perfect conclusion. Akuna Matata.